A note on translations. The 4th century of the Common Era saw the acceptance of Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire, the establishment of the New Testament canon, after nearly three centuries of discussion, is really decided even before the Didache, but, um, and the first translation of the whole Bible into Latin by the foremost scholar of the age, St. Jerome. You know, the Vulgate. There were, by that time, numerous partial translations of both what they call the Old and New Testament in existence. The earliest and best is the Septuagint Greek translation of what they call the, uh, of tonic, together with Syriac, Egyptian, Ethiopic, Arab, Arabic, and Armenian translations based on it. And translations of the New Testament in these languages, well, what they call the New Testament, uh, together with several popular versions in Old Latin, St. Jerome aimed to be conservative, using the work of his predecessors so far as accuracy permitted. But comparing the Latin with the original Greek texts of the New Testament, well, there was a lot of text um, with over 10,000 variants, but, and utilizing the Septuagint and original Hebrew, it's really called Aramea, but for the old, uh, for the tonic, he, well, the Septuagint was the Catholic Church's rendition of tonic. The Septuagint that the Jews put together is not found, and it's um, it doesn't have these leanings towards, uh, you know, it's, it's less supportive of Christianity, let's put it this way. He succeeded in turning out one of the three supreme biblical translations, the other two, of course, being that by Martin Luther and the English authorized version. His departures from the readings currently accepted caused much resentment at the time, leading him to deplore the conservatism of mankind in words that might have been echoed by countless translators in centuries to come. So great is the force of established usage that even acknowledged corruptions please the greater part, for they prefer to have their copies pretty rather than correct. Evidently, oh, eventually, however, his text, known as the Vulgate, came to be universally accepted and served as the basis for all other translations down to the time of the Reformation. Now, translation can be direct rather than, well, you know, than consulting previous translations, um, if it's a good translation. Um, I mean, it, it's a good idea to consult previous translations, but being direct proves it's a translation. As early as the 9th and 10th centuries, there were various English translations made of the Gospels, some of the Psalms, and other particular books, but the first English rendering of the whole Bible was produced by followers of John Wycliffe in the 14th century. There are two forms of what is known as the Wycliffe Bible, though Wycliffe himself had nothing directly to do with either. The early version of 1382, the work of Nicholas of Hereford and others, and the revised version of 1388, a much more accurate rendering by a group headed by John Purvey. Both versions were suppressed during the 15th century persecution of Wycliffe's followers, the Lollards. In fact, the Bible was regarded by church and state in England as being of such a dangerous and incendiary character that long after the invention of printing, no translation into the vernacular was permitted. William Tyndale, the first after the Wycliffe groups to undertake the task, was obliged to do his work in Germany, where his translation of what they call the New Testament was published in 1526. Martin Luther was then at work upon his marvelously vigorous and powerful German rendering, and Tyndale was somewhat influenced by him, an excellent scholar, he went behind the Latin to the original sources, and so highly did his work come to be esteemed that it was used extensively in the preparation of the authorized version of 1611. The first complete English 
printed Bible. It was produced in 1535 by Miles Coverdale, somewhat less of a scholar who was content to accept the Vulgate text as corrected by Luther, Tyndale, and other reformers. Then for a few years, English Bibles became thick and fast as publishers rivaled one another in striving to satisfy popular demand. In 1537, a re-editing of Coverdale by Thomas Matthew, supposed to have been the reformer John Rogers in 1539, a re-editing of Matthew by Richard Tevener, and in the same year another re-editing of Coverdale by Coverdale himself in a sumptuous folio edition known as the Great Bible from which the translation of the Psalms was taken into the liturgy of the Church of England as the Psalter, which is still a part of the Anglican and American Episcopal prayer books. Once more, the ruling class awoke to the revolutionary implications of the Bible, and in 1543 a law was passed that no woman, unless she be a noble or gentlewoman, no artificers, apprentices, serving men under the decree of your men, husband, or husbandmen, our laborers, be allowed to peruse this radical literature. With the persecution of the reformers under Queen Mary, the new translators were either executed, as was Rogers, or fled to the continent, as did Coverdale. Now, I don't think any of the... Well, I guess some people have written scriptures meant to be a secret from the people or something, but... Gathering in Geneva, the exiles continued the labors, of which the first product was a translation of the New Testament by Coverdale and William Whittingham, followed in 1560 by a translation of the whole Bible by Whittingham, Anthony Gilby, Thomas Sampson, and others. This edition, called the Geneva Bible, made use of the latest results of the Hebrew and classical scholarship, but was derisively known as the Breaches Bible. From its rendering of Genesis 3-7, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves breaches. The accession of Queen Elizabeth and the reestablishment of the Church of England brought the reformers home and led to the publication in 1568 of the Bishop's Bible, which was, however, little more than a revision of the Geneva Bible. It was now the turn of the Roman Catholics to seek the continent, where one of the best scholars, Gregory Martin, made a translation of the Vulgate, which was called the Douay Bible, from its place of publication in 1609 to 1610, and is the one still used by the Catholic Church. It is strongly, it's strongly Latinized vocabulary and, liter and literal fidelity to its source make it greatly inferior to the authorized version from the literary point of view. But, well, obviously, from the point of view of getting at the actual meaning, um, that's probably the best, better Bible. Um, the latter, the masterpiece of all translations in world literature, grew out of a plan presented by the scholar king James I to a conference of high and low church parties, summoned by him as 1604, learned men to the number of four and fifty were appointed to accomplish the task, chief among them that Lancelot Andrews, recently celebrated by T.S. Eliot, was familiar with fifteen languages. The Bishop's Bible was taken as the immediate basis, but Tyndale's, Matthew's, Coverdale's, and Wittenkamp's translations were also used all with constant reference to the Greek and Hebrew sources. The translators deliberately adopted the principles of striving to reproduce the meaning and spirit of the original rather than to produce a literal word-by-word -word -word rendering. Well, there were interpolations that you could say didn't fall under that, but and they devoted great attention to values of euphony and rhythm. That is to say, they were not only scholars, but conscious literary craftsmen. In the works of one of them, Dr. Miles Smith, the work costs the workman as light as it seemeth, the pains of twice, seven times, seventy-two days and more, 
An additional period of nine months was consumed in the seeing the book through the press. Thus, all told, the production took about three and a half years. A remarkably short time, considering the magnitude of the work and the magnificence of the result. For 250 years, men were entirely satisfied with the King James Version. Well, they had to be right. Um... <laughs> Aside from minute changes here and there, which were introduced in later reprintings, yeah, there's over a hundred different King James versions of the Bible, which did, which has included extra verses too. So, not quite the level of changes that happened in the Greek versions, but but during the mid 19th century such progress was made in hebrew and classical scholarship that by 1860 a more accurate translation seemed called for in that year the convocation of canterbury appointed a body of anglican clergymen to undertake the task in addition other denominations were asked to assist and american participation was invited so that the revised version might stand as the protestant bible of the english-speaking world enthusiastic cooperation was given from all sides and the work was carried on with the most painstaking thoroughness the new testament appeared in 1881 the, the old testament as they called it um in 1884 and the apocrypha is a kind of supplement in 1895 the immediate reaction was one of disappointment, particularly with the version of the New Testament. In the case of the Old Testament, generations of Jewish scholars from the time of Ezra on had produced by the second century of the Common Era something like a generally accepted text which was further perfected by the Jewish school of the Masoretic textual critics between the 6th and 8th centuries of the Common Era, but with what they called the New Testament, there was a great variety of available text and the choice between them and between different renderings of them being made by majority vote was not always either consistent or judicious. Furthermore, the translators decided always to translate the same Greek word by the same English word regardless of context, which made many passages awkward or obscure, while the greater accuracy of the revised version, especially in the instances of Job and Ecclesiastes, has caused it to be preferred by scholars. Its stylistic inferiority has prevented it from being from displacing the authorized version in the affections of most readers of the Bible. A recent attempts avowedly to modernize the style in the interest of still further accuracy, the most important is admirable. Short Bible, edited by Professors Edgar J. Goodspeed and J. M. Powis Smith and published by the University of Chicago Press in 1933, a scholar's edition of the whole Bible with all sections retranslated anointed uh, an, annotated and placed in the correct his historical setting still remains to be satisfactorily achieved. As far as literary value is concerned, however, the King James Version produced when the language is younger and more flexible is unlikely to ever be superseded. Its position as a world classic seems to be as secure as that of Homer, Dante, or Shakespeare, and it is the only translation in all literature which that can be said. And... The dates of the books. Um, this is this is dogma. Before thousand BC, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Code, in Exodus, the Red Sea Song and Numbers, the Song of Deborah, a fable of Jotham and Judges. Well, there's more than that, but not per se in versions that you would recognize as part of the Bible. Tenth century BCE, the court history of King David. In 2 Samuel, the blessing of Jacob in Genesis, the blessing of Moses in Deuteronomy, the oracles of Balaam in Numbers. Uh, that first part is actually later. Um, the 9th century BCE, the earliest draft of the first Samuel, the earliest draft of Judges, the J document in Hexateuch, 8th century BCE, E document in Hexateuch, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, the 7th century BCE, a combination of J and E, documents in Hexateuch, Deuteronomy, 1st and 2nd Kings, except ending, Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Jeremiah. In the 6th century BCE, we have second, the ending of 2nd Kings, 
We have the Deuteronomic Judges, the Deuteronomic 1st and 2nd Samuel, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, the Unknown Prophet, Haggai, Zechariah, the 5th century BCE, Leviticus, uh, oh, 5th century BCE, we have Joel, Alakai, Nehemiah, and this is based on dogma and the text rather than investigations into the history of the text. So the 4th century BCE, we have Leviticus, Chronicles, Ezra, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Tobit. The 3rd century BCE, Jonah, 2nd century BCE, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Daniel, Esther, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Judith, Susanna and the Elders, Ecclesiasticus, 1st century BCE, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, 50 to 65 of the Common Era, Letters of Paul, 70 of the Common Era, Gospel of Mark, possibly a generation in the first form, 80 of the Common Era, Gospel of Matthew, possibly a generation in the first form, Luke, 90, possibly a generation in the first form. Now, now okay, this is where we know is not the case. Um, we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not people who knew Jesus and um or even Paul, really. Um, but in the 120s, really, 120 to 150, we have those canonical gospels. 40 to 90, uh, the letter of James, probably towards the end. Uh, the non-Pauline letters are after 70. Um, that's all I know. Um 60 to 90, the Acts of the Apostles, 70 to 80, the Letter of the Hebrews, 90, Revelation. And did Revelation come before or after the book of Gospel of John? We don't know, but parts of it definitely existed in the 90s of both of them. So, And 100 to 125, the Letters of John, probably earlier forms there, right? Um, and... Note about the design and production of this book. The Bible, designed to be read as living literature, is set in 14 point Deep Den, a contemporary American book face designed by W. Frederick Gowdy for the Lanston Monotype Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Much of the characters have been recut and refitted for the special purposes of this text. Of this face, Mr. Kent D. Curie has said the outstanding characteristic of Deep Den is its acid. Typey quality. The letters seem to have been cu cut direct rather than interpreted from drawings, and while all of Mr. Gowdy's types have been singularly free of machine like regularity, there are tool marks and accidents to deep den that contribute greatly to its character. The Roman composes delightfully in an even warm gray color. The effect as a whole is regular and well ordered, but the variety. Okay, this is more boring than I... Uh, but I'm going to continue with that, right? Among the individual letters, speeds the eye and avoids monotony with charm. Deep Den is perhaps the most bookish face Mr. Gowdy has yet created. It has more interest, color, movement, quaintness than any standard book face that comes to mind. Yeah, typeface does have effect. If you look at my memes, I kind of try to play around with that. Um... He has been fortunate in securing a high degree of legibility for a deep den, makes easy reading, whether it be a paragraph or a hundred pages. The italic is a special interest that has more sprightliness and vigor than any italic hitherto available in every printer. It agrees admirably with the Roman in color and will make a delightful page of itself. Deep Den is brilliant and vigorous. It seems to lend spirit to very words themselves and inspires reading just as we prefer lively adult penmanship to regular schoolboy script. The text of the Bible designed to be read at its living literature offered a special problem in design that it called for the setting of prose, verse, drama, and letters. Typographic and production problems were naturally interwoven with many problems of editorial selection, arrangement, and presentation as explained in the editor's introduction. Deep Den Roman, italic, and small cats were used in various ways to meet the requirements of the text. The double title page evolved as a means of handling the long descriptive copy. The display lines on the main title page were hand-lettered in a style that harmonizes with the text face. At the same time, is in keeping with traditional established by centuries of Bible production. 
the composition, printing, and binding of this book were done by the Haddon Craftsman, Camden, New Jersey. The paper is a cream-laid market sheet, was supplied by Perkins and Squire Company, New York City. The general format was designed by Philip Von Doren Stern. And this is mod. So, we even have traditions with some of the... Um, some of the typeface and stuff I, um, one sees with the Jews stuff about and you know some of it shows the music of it all and I don't Some of it would have hidden meaning, right? <laughs>